Hi, NY. Yeah. Hi, NY is New York's largest community of cannabis activists and entrepreneurs. We're all here for mostly the same reason. Um, we're trying to get this movement going forward in the right direction, ending prohibition, creating opportunities, and ultimately supporting the people in this room and the greater community to be entrepreneurs, activists, and to make a difference. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for the first High NY of 2016. This is a really exciting time. This is the first time we're meeting where legal cannabis is available in New York. So that's a pretty big accomplishment. We've got some, a really restrictive medical program, but it's progress, it's better than nothing. Um, I'm going to introduce Julie from the Drug Policy Alliance to share a little bit about what's going on in New York today and give you an update on where things stand with New York's medical program. And before I do that, I just want to point out one, one idea for you to keep in mind throughout this evening, and that's that this community, High and Y, and the broader cannabis community and this industry will never be as small as it is today. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> this community will never be as small as it is today. It's going to keep growing. If everyone in this room stays active and involved, it's going to keep growing. And we're, we're still at the very beginning of things, despite people like Ethan and you know, Dana and some of the other folks in the room be, having done this work for decades now. You know, we're, we're still at the birth of the legal industry. So I, I hope that that encourages you to really connect with the people you meet here and find out how you can collaborate and support each other as everything expands. Now, really quick reminder, if you want to follow along on Twitter or Instagram, we're at HiNY underscore. So that's at HiNY underscore. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up Julie from the Drug Policy Alliance. Hey, how's everybody doing? Good, thank you. All right. Well, I'm gonna, I have to ask to give you a very brief update on the medical marijuana program, so I'm happy to do that. I think most of you probably know that in July of 2014, there was a medical marijuana law signed into, uh, a bill signed into law by Governor Cuomo. A lot of you may also know that that law was passed after tireless effort by a, a coalition of patients and caregivers who went up to Albany literally every week uh, during the legislative session and um, just lobbied their butts off to get that law passed. What you may also know is that unfortunately Governor Cuomo was not a fan of, of medical marijuana or marijuana reform in general and the bill that was ultimately passed was a compromise bill and was uh, actually quite narrow and restrictive uh, and did not do many of the things that we had hoped it would do. Nonetheless, uh, the program implementation has been ongoing for the past 18 months which was the time frame set out in the statute for the program to get off the ground. It was unfortunately not until mid-October that they launched a system for uh, physicians to register, and it was not until December 23rd that they uh, launched the system for patients to register. So it was a very late start. But on January 7th, the first dispensaries in New York opened, um, and it was a very, it was a historic day, eight dispensaries opened, and, um, Part of me really wants to celebrate that moment because it is the first time that uh, medical marijuana could be legally purchased in New York State. But I have to tell you, it's been very hard to celebrate because very few patients have been able to get access. Now, that's not a surprise given a lot of the limitations of the program, um, but it is a concern and it means that our fight uh, has to continue. So just to lay out for you some of the, the primary barriers that patients are facing right now, the, the sort of most immediate one is that there are very few physicians that have, uh, partic are participating in the project. Let me check my numbers here. As of yesterday, there were 247 physicians who had enrolled in the program. Right, there are 79,000 physicians in New York. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, a, a tiny number. What makes that worse is there's no way to find out who these doctors are. So we have dozens of patients calling us every day, and many of them in very desperate straits, many of them having waited years, literally years, to get access to this medicine, who simply have nowhere to turn and nowhere to go. Now we have asked the Department of Health repeatedly to make a list of physicians available to the public as they do in New Jersey. They have declined to do that. 
Um, what they are going to do is make a list available that other physicians can access. So uh, if you as a patient, it's incumbent upon you to go to your physician. If your physician's not participating, which is a very good chance, since there's only 240-something of them, you then have to ask your physician for a referral. Your physician then has to go on a, a secure website and see if they can find a referral for you. So that's the most immediate problem. But there are other limitations in the program that, are start, that we knew were going to be problems that I also want to draw your attention to. The first is that the program is, just leaves thousands of patients behind because of the limited number of medical conditions that are covered. All right, there are only 10 conditions that are currently covered by the program. The commissioner had to make a determination on five additional conditions uh, by the January 7th deadline, and he, there were five, uh, five conditions that included PTSD, rheumatoid arthritis, Alzheimer's, and a couple of other conditions. He declined to include any of those. Okay, so this is not an administration that's looking to expand the program. The other uh, big concern from a patient access standpoint is the limited number of producers and dispensaries. The state awarded only five licenses for producers. Now each of those producers can open four dispensaries. So that's 20 dispensaries, right, for a state of 20 million people and 54,000 square miles. Now right now only eight are open. But even if all 20 were open, which they su they're supposed to be by the end of the month, it means that there are huge parts of the state where patients, sick and disabled as they are, are going to have to travel sometimes an hour, hour and a half, two hours to get the medicine they need. Uh, and unfortunately, there, there's very strict restrictions on delivery, uh, so that creates a, another barrier. Now, the other thing that's emerging as, as a major concern of ours is affordability and access for low-income patients. Uh, we had uh, lobbied the Department of Health during the, while the bill was being drafted, while it was being negotiated, and, and while the regulatory system was being laid out, to create some kind of provision for patients that couldn't afford to pay for medicine. Now, there's a couple of ways they could have handled this. They could have created incentives for the companies that were applying to win a license, saying basically, we will uh, credit your application, weigh it more, more heavily and favorably if you make provisions for low-income patients. They chose not to do that. The other way they could do it is to use some of the tax revenues uh, from the sales of medical marijuana to create a charity pool. They've chosen not to do that. So that fight is another one that continues. So uh, th there's sort of good news and bad news. Uh, I know it mostly sounds like bad news, right? Um, the, the, the good news is that most of the things we're concerned about are within the authority of Cuomo himself and the health commissioner to change without statutory uh, amendments. That's the good news. The bad news is they don't seem very inclined to use that authority. So what that means is the role of pe people like you is ever uh, more important than it's, than it's been. We are going to be back up in Albany. Uh, the legislature's in session now. Um, fighting for amendments to the program to address some of these concerns and others that I've talked about. So I'm hoping that those of you who, who care about this issue and care about patients in New York will join us in that fight and get involved. The coalition that's leading this fight is called Compassionate Care New York. Um, our website is www.compassionatecareny.org and our Facebook page is Compassionate Care NY. Uh, we have monthly campaign calls where we talk about how you can get involved and, and help us um, pass some of these amendments and move the, the program forward. The next one of those is, is next Wednesday on the 27th at 6 p.m. If you go to our Facebook page or you talk to me afterwards, I can tell you how to sign up for that. Uh, the way this bill got passed was because people like you cared enough to call the governor, to go to Albany, to meet with your elected officials, to send emails, and that's, what's gonna, that's what it's going to take to make sure this program is workable. Um, we've got a long fight ahead of us, but I'm confident uh, that we can make the program successful uh, because, um, because we've got a law passed that was difficult to get passed and did it anyway. And we've, 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 we've moved them on other things, so I think we can move them on this. Great. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> I learned very recently at, at Scotty's event and Women Grow's event, uh, Sue Sicily came to speak about PTSD research, and the statistic is 22 veterans commit suicide every day. And that number is a low ball number. The real number I, I found out is closer to 55 every day because half the states don't report their numbers, and then a lot of suicides are called 
accident. Um, so there's this great organization, Weed for Warriors Project. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but they have a New York chapter, and they're doing a lot of work for the veterans and trying to raise funds to get PTSD covered. That's just another, another great resource for you to check out if you're looking for something to get involved. And uh, before I bring up Ethan, I just have to thank Impact Hub and Sam in the back for, for hosting us and giving us this space today. This is uh, an awesome space. They have three f levels of co-working space. A lot of startups work out of here that have a social justice or social enterprise angle. So if you're looking for a place to work with like-minded individuals, Sam, why don't you raise your hand so people know. You could talk to Sam and he'll be happy to get you situated. Without further ado, I'm gonna bring up the man that we're all here for. Uh, Ethan Nadelman has been fighting the good fight for decades now. He's got a JD and a PhD from Harvard. He was a Princeton professor. He's done a lot of work getting the laws to become not insane, but reasonable. And he's got a killer TED Talk. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. Uh, and he's the founder and executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance, which is a huge national organization that does work all over the world to, to end the drug war and replace prohibition with sensible policy. So without further ado, I'd love you guys to give a big high and wide welcome to Ethan Nader. Thank you, Michael. Just tell me, I, I'm just, I am, I'm gonna give a good talk here, but I am tired. So I'm gonna see if I sit down here. Can you all still basically see me pretty well? Okay, I'll be a little more intimate this way as well. So um, yeah, uh, Michael and Sam, thank you very much. And, and all the colleagues uh, for arranging this. For all of you who didn't make those calls, Go to the drugpolicy.org website tonight, sign up, because that way the next time there's an opportunity to make a call or to you know, try to figure out a way to wake up Andrew Cuomo in the middle of the night so he can, uh, you know, that, that you'll actually be able to do it. So, I mean, when she was serious, that a, a, the activism on this issue made it a massive amount of difference. And it's as simply as going to drugpolicy.org, putting in your address so we know you're a New Yorker, and then you'll start getting messages and alerts. Not a ton of them, but when something's hopping. And it won't just be on the marijuana issue, because the other thing I want to make clear here is that for Drug Policy Alliance, uh, you know, the work we do to end marijuana prohibition is just a third of the work we do, right? I mean, we're about ending the whole war on drugs, right? I mean, our, the, what drives us is the basic feeling that the war on drugs is essentially a monstrosity in our country and around the world. And that it is, a, it is a public health disaster, it's a public safety disaster, it's a fiscal disaster, and most of all, it's a human rights disaster, right? And that we have to end this whole thing, and that even if and when we succeed in legalizing marijuana, that can't be where we stop, right? We can't be where we stop. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a whole other part about ending mass incarceration. And the thing I'm most proud of, in a way, or one of the most things I'm most proud of, is the work that we did for about 12 years to more or less repeal the Rockefeller drug laws in New York. These draconian drug laws, you know, among the worst in the country. And one reason we had legitimacy when we went to Albany and started working on the medical marijuana issue and working on it is because we'd already led a battle on Rockefeller reform for 12 years and showing that we were going to go and fight and do it smart and bring together the radicals and the people who are in the middle and all, play all levels of this stuff. And the other third of the work we do is about treating drug use and addiction as a health issue. So in the 90s, when HIV and AIDS was rampaging and we weren't having needle exchange programs, stuff, we led the effort in New York and Jersey and California and other places to legalize needle exchange programs to reduce AIDS. You know, there are now, you may see on the front page of the New York Times, more people dying of an overdose involving either heroin or pharmaceutical opiates than dying in an auto accident, number one cause of accidental death in America. So we've been leading the effort for 10, 15 years to try to reduce overdose fatalities through getting 911 Good Samaritan laws passed so people can call 911 when there's an overdose they're not getting arrested or getting an uh, antidote, the locks are not available. So it, marijuana, part of it is about, it, it's a piece of what it means to end the whole war on drugs. And, and what I hope is that I know most of you here because marijuana but my sense is, if just how many actually care about the broader war on drugs? Just raise your hand. Okay, so I can see some of you not, some of you are here in the industry and that, but most of you are here. I should tell you also, when I'm going to talk to folks in the industry, well, I'll get to that. Let me start a little bit by just saying, you know, because this is a mi very much of a mixed age group right here, one of the things I'm aware of is 
how incredible what's happening now seemed 20 years ago, 25 years ago, even in some respects seven or eight years ago, right? And for those of you in your young 20s, you know, just sort of coming of political age and consciousness now, you know, I mean, it, 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 you can't imagine what this seems like for people that have been around for a while. I mean, there was this period in the 70s when 11 states decriminalized marijuana and it felt like things were really beginning to move and there was a whole openness in the culture and society. I was in college in the late 70s. I remember how we go, you know, I mean, that was before no smoking rules, right? You go to the movie theater and that person was smoking cigarettes, take a cigarette, and I was smoking a joint and he was smoking a cigarette, they were smoking a joint, you know, that's the way it was. It was chill, basically. Right, and you thought that's what it was going to be, and then along comes the '80s and the Reagan era and the war on drugs scare of the mid to late '80s, and like marijuana gets swept up in the war against cocaine and everything else that's going on. And one of the most telling, you see, support for legalizing marijuana drops from roughly 30 percent in the late '70s to a little over 20 percent in the late '80s. There's this annual survey of college freshmen that they do every year. One of the questions they say is, do you support legalizing marijuana? In 1979, 51% of college freshmen said yes. Ten years later, in 1989, Reagan years and all that, only 16% said yes. And I say that for two reasons. One is to realize how far we've come since 1989, when barely 23% of the country wanted to legalize marijuana, and now it's 53% or whatever. But the other thing is, is a reminder that sometimes things can go backwards. Now, there were reasons why it was easier to go backwards back then. There was a whole older generation who didn't know the difference between marijuana and heroin and all that sort of stuff, and that generation mostly died away, so they're less of a problem, right? But, I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it, there, there, that fact that things can turn around is something you have to really keep in mind, right? It's about one of the constant refrain I'm going to keep saying is, this is not in the bag yet. We have not won this battle yet, and overconfidence is one of the greatest things we have to fear. Now, the thing I want to say is, how do we get where we are now? Well, there's no, I can't give you a foolproof answer to how we went from 22% and those crazy drug war days of the late 80s to basically now having half the states in America having legalized medical marijuana, four states having legalized now, plus D.C. sort of, and this year you know, we're going to have another half dozen coming up that I'll talk about soon. I mean, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Obviously, the generational shift right? You know, the fact that older generation dying off, younger generation coming up. But then again, there are a whole lot of people, you know, in, in the 80s who kind of grew up in a drug war world. And I'm amazed at how many people of my generation actually didn't smoke marijuana or how many are willing to be hypocritical about it or how many are willing to be opposed to these reforms or how many are willing to have a double standard or to buy it you know, and all that sort of stuff, right? So I think that the generational passage was one thing. I think a key variable was medical marijuana. You know, I remember we got going on this stuff in the mid-90s, and there had been a pioneer named Bob Randall who had passed the first wave of, of early laws and the first guy to get a federal court to allow him to get his own legal marijuana from the federal government. But it was in 96, I remember when, um, you know, local activist Dennis Perone and guys around him drafted an initiative, really short, really simple, but it was a quixotic effort. I was able to come in, and I had just left the university and met George Soros and some other very rich guys, raise the money, get the campaign going, and we won the legalization of medical marijuana 20 years ago in California. It was the first time we showed this sort of nascent drug policy reform movement that we could play ball in the big leagues of American politics, and we stunned everybody. And people said... The opposition. I know what this is about. You know, you're not really about medical marijuana and patients. That's all a lot of bull, right? Well, all you are is a bunch of guys who want to get high and make it legal. And you know, my answer to that was, you know, there's some truth to that. <laughs> um, but the fact of the matter is, for me and many others, we were always in this for two reasons. The first was that when it came to medical marijuana, that the persecution and prosecution of people who were really using marijuana for medical purposes, 
struck us as the most egregious aspect of the war on marijuana, the most egregious aspect of the war on marijuana, and that if anybody deserved to be first in line to get the legal right to do this stuff, it was them, and that other things needed to be secondary to ensuring that people who really needed it for medicine got it. And quite frankly, that's where we are in New York right now. We still, we're beginning to mount and build and lay the, lay the seeds for broader legalization and ending the marijuana arrest, but the moral obligation of people who really use this stuff for medicine remains paramount here and in many other places, right? I mean, when you, when, you, when you know the evidence, when you see the people, what they're living with, you got to do that. But meanwhile, we had reason to believe that working on medical marijuana would change the way people thought about this stuff, right? You know, that simply we would shift the imagery. That when the media, and sure enough, this happened, you start talking about medical marijuana, and all of a sudden the, 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 the stock footage that the media uses shifts from being some like 17 year old, you know, you know with, with blonde dreadlocks and, you know, hemp leaves in his hair, you know, who's a high school dropout, you know, worrying about his, flipping out his parents, and it becomes an older person living with HIV or going through chemotherapy or MS or whatever it might be and using it as medicine, right? Those people become the face of who marijuana is, right? And the media can keep shifting there, but we we kept shifting there. You start having state legislative hearings, and they want to do the evils of marijuana, but then you do one on medical marijuana, and you're wheeling in people in their wheelchair to talk about MS and how, you know, when they smoke something, they can move and they can do it. So we humanize this thing, right? Cold-hearted right-wing politicians basically, you know, begin to tear up when they would have these, confront these cases. So we had something. And the other thing was, in the early, in the period of the 90s, when you still had the hysteria of the drug war, think about the drug war of the late 80s in America as like McCarthyism on steroids, <laughs> right? I mean, grounded in real fears about drugs coming to the country and about drug dealers and drug addicts, but the response being so monumentally inappropriate and indecent compared to the nature of the problem and the response that it deserved, right? By the 90s, people were beginning to have some questions but the two issues they, they were willing to peel away from the drug war on, one was that if you really use marijuana as medicine with a doctor recommendation, you should be able to get it, right? And that's how we won that. The second one was that if you have a drug addiction and you get picked up, you should get a chance for treatment a couple times instead of being sent to jail. We won another initiative about that in Arizona. So look, we won that one. And then we started looking around. We went a whole bunch more. Between 98 and 2000, we identified a bunch of other states, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, Colorado, Nevada, and Maine. Right? We did the polling. We saw. We drafted the initiatives. We won those things. We won seven in a row. Then Hawaii becomes the first state to legalize through the legislative system. We got a wave. And then ever since that time, my organization, Marijuana Policy Project, local activists in a range of press have done this where we've gone to the point where we are now. Right? We know now that 70% more, maybe 80 percent, depending on, you know, of Americans think marijuana should be legal for medical purposes, right? Um, we also know that notwithstanding that overwhelming support, there's still 25 states that haven't legalized it, even though a majority would favor it in even Mississippi at this point, right? <laughs> even Mississippi, even Mississippi, you know? You know, it's notable that even when we had 22 states as of a few years ago, which translates into 44 U.S. senators out of 100, we couldn't get a single hearing. We could barely get a bill in the U.S. Senate, even though we had over two-thirds support and 22 states. So the, the resistance of elected officials to going along with this stuff was really monumental. Now, there are other things, of course, that help explain the evolution. Part of it was the fact that we've now had three presidents in a row who, I mean, the first one said he didn't inhale, <laughs> second one uh, never admitted it, but an old friend outed him, it was Bush, and the third one said, yeah, inhale, wasn't that the point, <laughs> right? And kind of played it down for a while, but even now he's loosening up around it a bit, right? And so that helped change things. The fact that all of us who were born in the 50s, you know, land up in positions of power, and many of us know about marijuana. Even if we don't use it, we remember it. We may remember it fondly or at least know the realities about it. That helped. And then, of course, I mean, when you think about marijuana reform, as opposed to broader drug policy reform, I always think about what I, about what I would call our sort of elder sibling in the social justice struggle, which is the gay rights movement, right? Because in a way, we're the two issues that are kicking butt over the last 10 years, right? We're the two issues where what's going on now 
in terms of legalization of, of uh, you know, marriage equality, gay marriage, of all the other sorts of stuff, of, of the acceptance, and what's also going on with marijuana, is almost inconceivable. Right? If you had written this 10 years ago, people just would not have believed it. They wouldn't have, right? Now, if you ask, you know, part of what happened, I mean, with the gay marriage thing and gay rights thing, I mean, obviously part of that was the shock of AIDS and people going, what the fuck were people, all our friends are dying, we're dying, and getting animated and, and, and mobilizing in a huge way. Part of the success, right, was about people coming out. Right? It was people with the guts to come out to their family members, their colleagues, what have you, right? Part of the success was a movement that was disciplined and strategic, right? It was about thinking about languaging and messaging. You can't control a social justice movement. There's always going to be people doing crazy shit. There's always going to be people making missteps. There's always going to be people competing over all sorts of stuff. But it was about being really smart about how to frame this stuff, about how to present this to people, about how the things that make people feel so passionate about their personality and their sexuality are not necessarily the things you want to convey if you're trying to persuade skeptical voters and people are uncomfortable with gay people and gayness and, and want to have their eyes closed, right? And in a way, what's worked with marijuana has been many of the same things. There's obviously that element of coming out. There's obviously that element of, um, of, of, um, of, uh, of us being increasingly sophisticated about the way we do this and about the messaging. I'll give you one example. The thing that drives me and many others about legalizing marijuana is our regarding it as a fundamental issue of civil liberties, civil rights, human rights, racial and social justice, right? I'm not that interested in, in whether or not people are going to make a shitload of money on this thing legally, although they are, and I'm happy for them. That's great, especially if they do it the right way. Right? But the fact is, that's what drives me. And that's what drives a lot of the other leaders of this movement. But when it comes time for us to do ballot initiatives or legislative advocacy, I keep that to myself. Because that passion of mine is shared by maybe 10% of the population. And I can tell you from all the polling that we've done in the states when we do try to do these ballot initiatives, what we find, right, the battle right now at the ballot, remember, half the states have the ballot initiative process. New York is among the half that don't, right? What we consistently find is that for those people in the middle, think the soccer mom who maybe smoked weed in college, but she's not teenagers now, she's nervous about them. Think the people who never use marijuana, but maybe they got a few friends who do. Think you know, all the people who are, eh, I don't know, I was always against this, now I'm going to think about it. What moves them? You know what our polling shows? Two basic arguments. The first one is, I'd rather have the cops focusing on real crime instead of busting young people for some weed. That one resonates strongly. And the second one, the second one is, I'd rather, instead of giving the money to the gangsters in Mexico and America and everywhere else, I'd rather have the government get taking in the money as tax revenue so that they can either lower my taxes or else spend the money on good things like education and schools and treatment and blah, 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 blah. And those two arguments, we have an understanding with many of our allies in the marijuana reform movement. Use whatever message you want, or what you want in the months be way before the election. Use, if you want to use the argument, marijuana is safer than alcohol, which it is, right? And we want that argument. People understand that more. Use the argument about civil liberties. Use the argument about racial justice. Use whatever arguments you want to use. Come Labor Day, focus. Focus on our two messages. Focus on the messengers. You know one of the big, most successful ads we think that worked in Oregon in 2014? Was the sheriff of King County, um, Washington State saying, you know what, it's working up here. I can't tell you what to do in Oregon, but every reason will work there too, right? It's thinking about the messengers. It's thinking about the image. It's about all of that sort of thing. It's the discomfort, right? Dane and I were talking about before, about doing smokeouts or like public events with smoking, right? I don't, I'm not a fan of that. I think there will come times and places to do that, Right? But, you know, quite frankly, I remember a time we had a bill in New Mexico legislature, a medical round 15 years ago, and people showed up smoking on, on the state. state uh, we wanted to kill them 
because it basically killed the bill that we had built all this stuff for. What it did was it played into the hands of our opponents who said, look, that's who's really what we're talking about there. They're disrespecting the law. Hey, we have no smoking laws. They're disrespecting, you know what I mean? This sort of stuff. And it's the same thing in which I think in the gay rights movement, there was a wariness about how out front is somebody going to be about gay intimacy. There are many people who in America are uncomfortable with witnessing gay people being intimate who nonetheless adamantly, firmly believe in the right of gay people to be fundamentally equal, right? And it's understanding that when you're talking about the principle or the policy or justice as opposed to getting to people's social comfort, which brings us to the last piece. The other similarity between gay rights, I think, and the marijuana reform thing is that, and we can't measure this, it's the role of the social me of media. Not the news media, that's helped, it's come more and more our way on both issues. It's TV, it's drama, it's movies, right? In the same way, you know, I used to say that, you know, it, think about the evolution of the gay rights movement. In the, 50 years ago, everybody in America knew a homosexual. They just didn't know they knew a homosexual. And therefore, their image of who was a homosexual was who they saw, like, you know, the, 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 the teacher who got fired or the people arrested in the men's room or, or the people outrageously on uh, Christopher Street, right? That was the image, right? Now, of course, everybody knows only Everybody knows a person who's gay or lesbian, and they know him intimately and familiar, and it's, their whole image has changed, right? Well, similarly with marijuana, we've gone from a reefer madness to Cheech and Chong. You go to that period where it's the Cheech and Chong, and then you go to the demonization phase, like where you literally have the drugs are off is trying to pay Hollywood to put anti-marijuana messages in the media. And then you start to have a kind of easing in with the marijuana characters. And it gets to the point, you know, I remember you see these movies, like Susan Sarand never like does a movie if she doesn't without smoking pot. I think it must be in her contract. We'll not do a movie unless she's stepmom and, and Thelma Louise and you, you, you name it. One way or another she finds a way to, to, to smoke weed, right? And, but I, I think, what was, what was that movie? It's, it's complicated. An older movie, it's, it's complicated, it's a movie, it's a romance movie for middle-aged people. It's, uh, was it Meryl Streep with Steve Martin and Alec Baldwin, and they're both, and there's this scene where, where Meryl Streep goes on a date with Steve Martin, right? And they smoke a joint, and they have a great time, and it's all just, everything's chill, right? Anyway, the movie gets an R, right? Even though there's no cursing, they'll say there's nothing in it. Why the movie board says do they give it an R? Not because they smoke marijuana, but because nothing bad happened. Because they smoke marijuana, right? They had a good time, exactly. But that evolution, that transformation, that easing up, right, I think has played a huge... Well, after we passed the first medical marijuana initiative, every single TV show, both comedy and drama, figured out a way, not every, but almost every, figured out a way to weave a medical marijuana theme into their storyline, either for tears or for laughs. So we've moved this far. Okay, and here we are. It's 2016, January in 2016. We got four states under our belt. It seems like it's working pretty well so far. Colorado, sky has not fallen. Tax revenues are surprisingly good. There's issues around edibles. You know, maybe Colorado seems to have higher rates of adolescent marijuana use, but it's not off the charts compared to other places, right? You know, Washington State's kind of got a more rig regimented system, but it's beginning to roll out. Oregon just got going. Alaska comes online soon. They're going to be doing the interesting things where people can smoke like at clubs and all this sort of stuff. D.C., we don't have full legalization because Congress would probably smack them down, but we have almost full legalization of this stuff, so it's moving, right? And then now, you know, between DPA, MPP, a few others, 2016, the big one, California. California, and then there's going to be Nevada, and there's going to be Arizona, and Maine, and Massachusetts, and we'll see if Michigan maybe pops up as well. And medical, Florida's going to come back again, and I'm pretty sure Missouri's going to have medical, Arkansas might, maybe one of the Dakotas, and there may be an effort in Ohio to get medical. Maybe, even, I don't, we'll see what happens in Ohio, that's a funny story, right? You know, so we're going to have somewhere between five and six legalization initiatives on the ballot this year, we're going to have somewhere between two and four or five medical initiatives on the ballot, we got to win California and at least a majority of the rest, right? And I'm worried. I'm worried. Now, California, I can tell you, I mean, that's the one that's been DPA's priority, right? And your drug, my organization, Drug Policy Alliance. I mean, that has been one, cra I've never been in a coalition that was that intense and that, you know, zigzagging and roller coaster. Fortunately, it's in a great place right now. 
We have a, a powerful coalition. My fear is that we're going to have more than one initiative on the ballot. I think that's highly unlikely. I think we have to raise a lot of money, but we got some key people behind it. We got the lieutenant governor. We've got buy-in. It is going to be the new goal. I think Oregon's now the current gold standard for marijuana legalization laws. I think California will become. Not only is it smart about California was especially tough because they were the first to legalize medical marijuana, but they never set up a statewide legal regulatory system. So it was you know crazy in California, especially in Southern California. You, right? Then they finally, in the middle of us drafting the ballot initiative, decide to finally pass a medical criminal regulatory law, screwing up everything. We had to go back to the drawing boards to fix this thing. But then there's the fact that you have the dynamic marijuana industry. You have people like in Humboldt and Mendocino going, what about us? Are we going to get squeezed out? So we designed like a three-tier licensing system so that not the big players, the, the taking off the caps on how much can produce can't happen for five or ten years. We have lower fees for people who are like the smaller actors so we can try to encourage a, a microbrewery or vineyard type model. We also, this whole thing, we say, let's do the alcohol model. But if you do the alcohol model, it's almost impossible to hire somebody who's ever had a felony conviction. But what we're trying to do is do a little social justice here. So we wove into this law the ability to do some stuff so that people had a felony conviction, that there's some ways for them to begin to get involved in this industry. So we broke some new ground. We dedicated some of this money, not just, you know, I mean, dedicating it for schools and construction is a huge win. You get people who don't like marijuana, but they say, you're going to tax weed to pay for schools? I can live with that, right? So, but we're also getting money going to inner city communities and do stuff like that. We're, we're trying to do this thing right, right? And the regs, all of this stuff, we got to win California. California, almost 40 million people. California, that, all of the four states, Washington, Colorado, Oregon, and well, I think the total population of all four states is what, about 12 million, 12, 13 million? We're going to more than triple it just with California. When I go down to Mexico, because we work internationally as well, I ask people, what's it going to take to get things moving down here? They say, when you legalize weed in California. I say, well, what about like Colorado and Washington? That helped. Give us California. What about Oregon and Alaska? That helped. Give us California. If you could do Texas, that would be great too. But give us California, <laughs> right? It, it, the California winning will resonate right throughout Latin America, the Caribbean, all of that. It will have a global impact, right? Now, the others, Nevada, what's the fear there? The polling's pretty decent there, but Sheldon Adelson, that's home for him. Sheldon Adelson, the right wing billionaire, right, who's like the third richest guy in America or something. You know, I mean, quite frankly, that guy dropped $5 million into Florida to oppose the medical marijuana initiative. Florida is the only state where you need 60% to win an initiative. It landed up only getting 57%, probably because Shelley put his $5 million bucks in there. You know, and he's not, he doesn't like marijuana, and he's got worry about casino licenses, and it gets complicated if you're in a state where people can smoke weed and all this. But, you know, and meanwhile, you got to get, so we got to watch out there. Arizona. I worry about the polling in Arizona. And I heard that the owner or the owner's wife of the Diamondbacks, the baseball team, has already pulled together a meeting uh, of people to oppose this. We could have a problem. Maine, we almost had two campaigns going in Maine, two different organizations with very similar initiatives. Unfortunately, DPA and other guy were able to use some carrots and sticks to get one initiative on the ballot there. Maine, I think we should have a decent shot. We'll see. Massachusetts, let's hope so. Right? We'll see. Medical, I think Florida, if he doesn't go back again, I don't think he will this time. Missouri, it polls well. But it's not in the bag, and we're almost inevitably going to have some defeats this coming year. Right? Now, the other thing that's going on is what happened in Ohio. You know about Ohio? Those of you who don't know, Ohio, I got a call about over a year ago, can DPA help these guys with a map, map initiative in Ohio? And we told, they told us what they had in mind. And we said, look, we'll help you make this as good an initiative as possible, but you can't use our help to say that we endorsed it. And the reason we didn't want to endorse it is, what they did is they got 10 investors, each to put up two and a half million bucks. And the initiative is very good in terms of 1,000 licenses and protecting patients and allowing home grow and all this stuff. But they wrote in that only the 10 investors are technically the properties they own would be allowed to grow marijuana wholesale in perpetuity. This would be in the state constitution. 
So basically, people gagged on that. And the uh, opposition campaign was co-led by anti-marijuana people and pro-marijuana legalization people who were disgusted by that model. And I basically was out there saying, we cannot endorse something with this model. A, a win in Ohio? Could you imagine legalization winning in Ohio? Imagine what that would do, the presidential debates? Imagine, I mean, the national energy? In that sense, it would have been amazing. But quite frankly, to have shown that that model, that type of over-the-top greed would be the right way, would have been a bad thing. And in that sense, I was ambivalent. I kind of part of, well, and there was another initiative on the ballot to invalidate any initiative that had an oligopoly or monopoly in it. So I was sort of hoping that both initiatives would win, that they would vote to legalize and vote to oppose the oligopoly, and then nobody would know what would happen. We get stuck in the courts for years. Meanwhile, 2016, all the presidential candidates are there, and we could say, hey, Ohioans, Ohio of all places, will vote for it. Anyway, that thing went down. The other one won, so that's dead. But we have this issue now with the industry, right? And it's a real dilemma for me. You know, because the industry, I find myself going and talking to industry meetings. And as I saw a flyer out there, the next speech I'm going to give is going to be in San Francisco, March 3rd, for an industry event, or it's a debate, I think. And I'm saying to these guys, you know what? Much of the progress we had, it was because me and one or two other guys raised money from a lot of billionaires and half a billionaires like George Soros and Peter Lewis and John Sperling and George Zimmer and a bunch of others. But you know what? Peter Lewis, the number one funder of marijuana legalization, died a couple years ago. And John Sperling died last year. And, you know, another guy, Bob Wilson, if you don't know, he passed away a couple years ago. And George Soros, my main man and major backer on DPA, you know, a third of DPA's fu funding. But George is like, Ethan... Marijuana, it's in the bag. Let's move on to other issues. The rest of the drug war, you care about the other stuff, right? And there's a sense in which the industry is going, man, it's like mana falling from heaven. Gold is in the streets, right? And we didn't have to spend a penny to get it here. We got a lot of good do-gooders like Nadelman and Campy and Boyd and a few other guys bringing all the money in. They're creating these wonderful profit opportunities for us. God, that's nice of them. Who are they again? But we're going to make some money, Right? And then I go and say, hey, guys, I'm your fucking daddy. And you don't even know it. <laughs> and it's like, are you going to step up now? And they look at me and go, what's in it for me? And I go, I mean, there's a whole, if this stuff doesn't keep going, if we had lost Oregon and Alaska, which was quite close in 2014, that would have cost the industry collectively tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Everything would have backed up. All of a sudden, the White House would have been pretty good, would have been backing up. All of a sudden, the momentum would have, been, would have slowed. All of a sudden, our opposition would have been emboldened. Think big picture. But there is no big picture thinking in the industry basically now. Right? I go to these, go to these comments and I say, you guys stand at a unique intersection in American history. Never before has a movement for social, a movement driven, you know, primarily by people who cared about social justice and civil liberties and human rights and racial justice landed up creating a legal market that's going to be worth tens of billions of dollars in short time. Never before. If you look at our fellow social justice movements, you look at gay rights, women rights, civil rights, even abolition, slavery, major economic consequences, but not in creating brand new legal markets in the way that we are doing. The closest analogy, right, is alcohol prohibition. We have alcohol prohibition, but that essentially just re-legalized something that had been legal just 15 years before, right? So you guys have a special obligation to understand what you're part of, where you came from, what this is about. You have some obligation to do this right, not just because that's going to be good business, but do it right because there is some element of more. It's a moral a movement that got us where we are now. This is not like tech. Right? This is not like other things, not like the energy. It's not this and that. It's something different. And 70, 80% of the people in the audience look at me and go, what the fuck is he talking about? They just don't get it. It's like they're hustling. They're trying to make a little money. You know, That's what they're trying to do. And then I say, look, quite frankly, I don't want to meet most of you. I only want to meet a few of you. And the only ones of you I want to meet and spend time with are those of you who meet, who meet two criteria. The first is that you're going to make a shitload of money in this industry and do so in an ethical way. And the second is that you either have or will acquire a social justice consciousness so that you'll care about the bigger issues for which we're fighting. And fortunately, 
fortunately, fortunately, more the, I ha people are coming up. But even to you know, even when I look what's on the on the horizon right now, you'd think that the industry would be piling on money, but you saw it, they're able to pile it on. When they when I asked, I was in uh, Chicago last week, and I asked one of the guys who had invested and got it out. And I said, how can you explain smart investors, big shot names, you know, famous people, Oscar Robertson, former Basil Par, people from the famous Taft family, other people. How did they do it? Why did they do it? How could they actually believe that thing was going to win with that principle? And he just said, greed. Greed can produce a lot of money. Greed can even make people stupid. It can even make people have a lot of money stupid, right? But we have to figure out that nut. The other thing I'm worried about is, we still have a lot of influence over this stuff. DPA, MPP, a few other actors, and we care about these bigger principles. But assuming we win most of these initiatives in 2016, that industry is going to take another major leap forward. And at that point, the wealth of the industry and maybe their ability to begin to operate in a more organized way is going to become so significant that our influence, those of the reformers who have led this for the last 20 years, is inevitably going to be diminished. Now, that's going to be, in some respects, a very good thing because it means that people driven by economic self-interest will land up paying for the, for the basic, the, the effort to end marijuana prohibition. But it's not going to be such a good thing because it's going to be driven particularly by pecuniary interests, right? So just to conclude, where we are now is a lot of initiatives on the ballot. Maybe Vermont will become the first state to legalize. Governor Shumlin of Vermont just put in his State of the State speech last week or two weeks ago saying he supports it. Let's do it. We got issues around edibles we got to figure out and make sure that goes right. We're going to see more and more bills being introduced, right? This thing is moving forward. There's an international piece, which I didn't talk about, but I can at some other point. So I leave with this message. The momentum is on our side. We can do this. This is first and foremost for me about ending marijuana arrests, about ending the criminalization and stigmatization of people who use marijuana, right? But it is not in the bag. It is not a done deed. And in the states like New York, which do not have a ballot initiative process, it's going to be a long, hard slog. We're going to encounter right-wing opposition, and then we're going to encounter the strange stuff, like a guy like Cuomo who's been good on sentencing reform and some of the health stuff, but just somehow has got something weird and anti-marijuana about him that we just don't get, and that doesn't even seem to be political, because what he's doing is not even political. There's something else going on, and it's either some crass calculation we can't figure out or it's something personal about marijuana. So it's going to be a long battle, Why an industry that's going more and more prominent, the media focusing on its stuff, and we're just going to have to get better and better and better. What can you guys do? Look, I mean, just if you're involved in marijuana in one way or another, selling it, buying it, consuming it, whatever, do so responsibly. If you consume, do so responsibly. If you are a parent, do so responsibly. If you sell, do so responsibly. Responsible behavior on the part of as many participants as possible is what's going to clinch this thing for us. Secondly, Get politically active to the extent you are not now. Please go home or do it after we, I, with this. We had a, go to drugpolicy.org, sign up. And we have led this effort in New York. We are not going anywhere. We led the effort on Rockville Law Reform, led the effort on medical marijuana, on needle exchange, overdose prevention, and we're going to lead the effort around ending marijuana arrests, and lead, which we've done been doing, and lead the effort on marijuana legalization. But we need your help and support. Let me stop right there. Thank you very much. Don't assume it's in the bag, right? Everybody feels like cannabis legalization in America is inevitable. They're beginning to think it's just going to, marijuana is just going to legalize itself. The people looking at money in it, making it make money in this are just counting on all the activists to just keep doing what they're doing without thinking where the money is coming from to make that happen. And the activists sometimes are getting so overconfident that they think we can win anything. So I think we have to keep in mind we're in a very real, very tough political battle and it is far from over.